Well, welcome everyone. My name is Bill Sellers. I'm the president of National History Academy, and uh, we're pleased to have you with us today in our uh, Wednesday afternoon series of, of virtual tours. Uh, today, we're uh, privileged again to have Dr. Brent Glass, the uh, Executive Director Emeritus at the Smithsonian National Museum of Amer American History, and for the last a uh, couple of years. Uh, he's also served as the executive director of, uh, of, of Sing Sing. Uh, they've got some very, uh, the, the prison, and uh, they've got some incredibly interesting uh, educational programs on uh, criminal, our criminal justice system, criminal justice reform. Uh, joining Brent today will be Nicole Hamilton, the collections manager at, uh, at Sing Sing. And uh, and just uh, before we start, I uh, might just uh, mention that we're about three weeks away from our National History Academy summer programs for high school and middle school students. Um, we're kicking off July 5th with um, uh, a series of week-long cases. We've just uh, put out today, uh, or yes, just, just today, our workshops. We've got 13 workshops that go from uh, a one one-hour program in an afternoon, uh, a couple of two-hour programs, um, most of them are one day, although there are a couple of two, three, and four day programs uh, on, on different topics. There's uh, uh, Central High School in Little Rock, uh, Cesar Chavez National Historic Site, uh, Minidoka National Historic Site. Uh, there's a session on how to be an historian if you're, if you're interested in studying history in, in college. But uh, you know, please check out our website at nationalhistoryacademy.org for more information. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Glass uh, for our presentation today. Uh, Brent? Thank you, Bill. We're going to start. Uh, Nicole and I are delighted to be here, and we're going to start with a brief uh, video introduction. Hello and welcome to Sing Sing Stories, um, Stone on Stone. I'm Brent Glass, the Executive Director of the Sing Sing Prison Museum. And again, thank you to Bill Sellers and the team at the National History Academy for allowing us to share some stories about Sing Sing Prison and its, uh, and its history and also what we're doing to create a museum uh, at, at Sing Sing in Austin, New York. The song uh, that we just heard was by Joan Baez, who wrote about her performance at Sing Sing Prison on Thanksgiving Day in 1972. The concert is preserved in a remarkable video by David Hoffman, uh, and the photographs we saw are from Sing Sing's history that began in 1825 and continues today as a maximum security prison known as Sing Sing Correctional 
facility in Ossining, New York. I want to thank a member of our team, Victoria Gonzalez, who's the communications director for the museum, for putting together that introductory video. Um, I want to um, again thank the Academy uh, as we explore uh, Sing Sing's history and also our plans to build this museum that connects history to the contemporary issues of criminal justice reform. I want to make two comments before we get started. First, we often hear references to Sing Sing prison and other prisons as houses of fear uh, with notorious reputations. And while it is true that Sing Sing has a history as a brutal and a violent institution and the birthplace of mass incarceration, uh, this museum that we're creating is more focused on the human experience of the people incarcerated there and the people who work there. Therefore, we refer to the prison population as people who are incarcerated, not convicts, inmates, offenders, prisoners, or other terms that define them by what they did rather than by their present condition. As much as possible, we are avoiding a sensationalism and crude jokes associated with prisons and punishment. We're less interested in celebrity prisoners, great escapes, riots, and executions, and instead we're more engaged in pulling back the curtain of ignorance surrounding this subject. And I, I'm speaking as a historian who spent a lot of my career uh, studying American history, and I confess, confess to my ignorance until the last several years of just how complex and compelling this history can be. We want to challenge all of us to ask the question, in a democracy that values equality and liberty, what is the purpose of prison? This is a fundamental question that is both timeless and timely. The second point I would like to make concerns the content of this program. It is true that every chapter in the history of criminal justice in America has a few pages written at Sing Sing Prison. However, we are going to share just a few stories and hope to inspire our audience uh, to pursue more information on our website and in so many other sources, books, articles, libraries, museum collections, films, uh, TV production. We have a wonderful staff at the Sing Sing Prison Museum who put this program together. Nicole Belderisi, Victoria Gonzalez, and Nicole Hamilton, who will join me this afternoon and guide us through this historical journey and introduce our plans for the museum. We look forward to your questions following the presentation. Um, in exploring this history and any history, we have three basic assumptions. History is based on evidence, written, physical, visual, and oral. History is not inevitable. It happens because people make decisions and take actions to lead, that lead to change or preserve the status quo. And finally, history is a resource that helps us understand our own lives and our own times. And so the stories we present to you today, we have labeled river, rocks, railroad, ruin, and reform. So let's begin with Nicole Hamilton, the collections manager at Sing Sing Prison Museum. All right. I want to thank Bill and the History Academy for welcoming us. Uh, it's sort of exciting to be on the other side of it. I've been watching these presentations every week. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the early history of Sing Sing Prison. Uh, and this talk is really informed by research and work done by Lee Bernstein, Roger Panetta, Art Wolkinski, Guy Chelly, and Dana White, to name just a few, as well as my colleague, Nicole Belderisi. So the main question we really want to look at is, is why here? Why did they choose this area on, in New York to be the site of a prison? And it's not a simple question, and there are a lot of reasons why, but we're going to focus on one specifically right now, the Hudson River. At this time in the 1820s, the Hudson River is an incredibly important resource for not only New York, but the United States. First, it's the major for thoroughfare for goods and people, and often it was easier to go by boat than to travel on land. This is a time when there really aren't paved roads, and it's very rural, and the land is very rocky and hilly. 
So for people and goods going north to south or south to north in New York City, or sorry, in the state of New York, the river is really critical and it's what connects New York City to the rest of the state. Um, it becomes even more important in 1825 when the Erie Canal is opened. It connected up at Albany and the Erie Canal is really what opened New York to the Midwest and increased travel and commerce and helped solidify New York and New York City as the epicenter of the American economy. The Hudson River is 315 miles long and as you go south into the lower Hudson, it also provides deep water access for boats and ships out in New York Bay. So we can see just why building on the banks of a river makes a lot of sense. Um, So in May of 1825, the warden of Auburn prison, Elam Lins, pictured here, and 114 incarcerated men from Auburn and keepers, which is what they called guards, uh, boarded canal boats and sailed through the Erie Canal and down the Hudson River. Lins is described as a strict disciplinarian who believed that floggings, beatings, and starvation were ways to control the incarcerated population. So let's imagine for a moment what these incarcerated men would have seen on their way down. Thomas Cole, a landscape painter and a leading member of the Hudson River School, the 19th century American art movement, wrote in 1836 about the Hudson Valley, which is pictured here. Um, you see no ruined tower to tell of outrage, no gorgeous temple to speak of ostentations, but freedom's offspring, peace, security, and happiness. On the margin of that gentle river, the village girls may ramble, and the glad schoolboy with hook and line pass his bright holiday. Those neat dwellings, unpretending to magnificence, are the abodes of plenty, virtue, and refinement. And in looking over the yet uncultivated scene, the mind's eye may see far into futurity. Where the wolf roams, the plow shall glisten, and the gray crag shall rise, temple and tower. Mighty deeds shall be done in the now pathless wilderness, and poets yet unborn shall sanctify the soil. So we have this incredibly idyllic location. And it's a place of promise and freedom and, and innocence, but likely the incarcerated men on the canal boats thought very differently. They had landed on the shores of Sing Sing on May 14, 1825 at the 130 acre site that had been chosen. And they immediately built temporary barracks that were heavily guarded and went to work quarrying stone all day, only using wheelbarrows and mules. They were literally building the cells in which they would soon be confined. Whoops. When Alexander de Tocqueville and Gustave de Beaumont came to the U.S. to learn about how America was creating and reforming prisons in 1831, they stopped at Sing Sing. And de Tocqueville remarked on the Hudson River and the local area, saying, quote, except the view of the Bay of Naples, the world has not seen such scenery. But while looking out at sort of this beautiful view afforded by the Hudson River Valley, to his back was this world of immense brutality. And he comments on that as well, saying, quote, while society in the United States gives the example of the most extended liberty, the prisons of the same country offer the spectacle of the most complete despotism. So we see this real duality going on. On the one hand, the Hudson River represents all of American promise and you know, pastoralism and peace, and it's virtuous. But on the other hand, we have incarcerated men who've sailed down the river, that same river, to build their own prison. And I just want us to pause for a moment and sort of appreciate that incredible tension. Um, but now Brent will share with us that actual experience of building the prison. Thank you, Nicole. Stay, stay on to Tocqueville for just a second, please. Um, there were several factors, uh, practical, political, and philosophical, that influenced the building of Sing Sing Prison in 1825. We must acknowledge the influence of the Enlightenment, the intellectual movement based in Western Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries that emphasized reason, progress, 
individual rights and self-government. And this is important because this is what influenced uh, de Tocqueville and de Beaumont in thinking that's what they would find when they came to the United States in, in 1831. Another factor is the Second Great Awakening, the religious revival that promoted saving souls through emotional prayer meetings and evangelical organizations. Uh, this movement swept through uh, America in the early decades of the 19th century. Many of the reform movements of that period, uh, abolition of slavery, temperance, um, women's suffrage, prison reform, were influenced by the Second Great Awakening. And conditions in New York also shaped the establishment of Sing Sing Prison. Newgate Prison, which was located in New York uh, City's Greenwich Village, had reached its capacity, and the state could not afford to expand in New York City's expensive real estate market. Sing Sing Village, which had been incorporated in 1813, located about 40 miles north of New York, and the site of an enormous limestone quarry was an ideal location. Now we can go to the next slide. So as, as Nicole indicated, um, the men uh, who joined Elam Linz to the uh, site at, at uh, what became Sing Sing Prison uh, were employed breaking rock uh, and creating and building their own prison. The name Sing Sing is uh, from the local indigenous dialect that means stone on stone. So the, uh, this uh, limestone quarry and its location next to the river made for an ideal location. This was a tremendous effort, a tremendous um, prodigious uh, undertaking. They had no um, uh, access to advanced technology. This was pure muscle power, perseverance, but also a great deal of skill. The men, uh, when they were breaking rock, each stone weighed approximately 230 pounds, much heavier than most men in that period. And they, they uh, built a um, extraordinary building. Next slide. Another image of, of some of the conditions in which uh, the men were working. Um, now let's go to the next slide. They built two buildings. Um, the image at the top is the uh, stone shell, uh, shell building that was built um, at, in, in uh, 1825. This is um, building measures 476 feet in length. It was about 50 feet wide. And the initial building was four tiers high, which meant that it could house 800 men in tiny cells, uh, six and a half feet high, seven feet long, and three feet, three inches wide about the size of a, of a yoga mat. The second building um, was a, uh, which is shown in the, in the uh, middle of this image, and, um, is, the, is the cell block itself. The cell block was a building within the stone shell, and it housed uh, the 800 cells that uh, I just mentioned. And then the third image at the bottom of this uh, slide is, a, is the plan of the, uh, of the cell block. So there were um, 200 cells on each uh, level, 100 on each side, uh, initially four levels, uh, later expanded in 1831 to five levels, which is the drawing you see here. And then around just before the Civil War, um, another uh, tier or level was added. So the, the total was um, uh, a total of 1,200 cells. Next slide. Um, as I said, each, each cell uh, measured uh, six and a half feet high, three, seven feet long, three feet, three inches wide. Uh, very often, more than one person occupied a cell. Conditions in the cell block were awful. Little natural light, poor ventilation, no running water. They used the bucket system for fresh water and, and waste. Even by 19th century standards, this would qualify as cruel and unusual punishment. Next uh, slide. The penal philosophy at Sing Sing uh, also followed what became known as the Auburn System, a program that emphasized solitude, silence, and hard labor. Groups of incarcerated men marched in lockstep to nearby qu uh, limestone quarries and produced 
construction stone for the growing urban market and for major infrastructure projects. Harsh discipline in, imposed by Elam, Lin, El, Elam Linz and his successors uh, managed through fear and force. Observers noted, sometimes with shock and revulsion, the sight of men hauling stone up the steep hill, hillsides like mules. Next slide. The core belief behind the penal philosophy at Sing Sing and Auburn and many other prisons uh, was that individuals could reform and become better citizens. In practice, however, Elon Linz uh, and his successors instituted the silence and solitary confinement, not as a change for individual reflection, but a, as a means of social control, preventing riots, violence, and other disruptions. This became the model for hundreds of prisons throughout the United States. Uh, and so when de Tocqueville and de Beaumont visited, um, and when uh, Charles Dickens visited Eastern State Pen Penitentiary, they were shocked at the uh, what, examples of what was called democratic punishment. And they were especially in, uh, disappointed in the use of corporal punishment and torture uh, to discipline the prison population. Next slide. Um, a year following the visit by de Tocqueville and de Beaumont, the cholera ex uh, epidemic of 1832 exposed the harsh realities of Sing Sing's architecture of confinement. The densely populated cell block and the congregant labor routine created a perfect environment for the deadly disease of cholera. Dr. Lewis Beck, the president of the New York Medical Society, documented the spread of this disease in Canada and New York, including Sing Sing Prison, where the first death occurred on July 17, 1832. By August 6, just three weeks later, 236 cases and 72 deaths were reported out of a population of 939. Epidemics including cholera, tuberculosis, flu, HIV AIDS, and COVID-19 virus are significant stories within Sing Sing's larger narrative. Change the slide. In spite of the disease and occasional efforts to reform Sing Sing's harsh regimen, the, the prison managed to sustain itself through the production of construction stone and other materials. Sing Sing's quarries provided stone for Grace Church on Broadway uh, in New York, New York University, a courthouse in Troy, New York, the City Hall in Albany, and Lyndhurst, the Tarrytown Mansion designed by Andrew Jackson Davis. Public works projects included the Croton Aqueduct in 1842, the Hudson River Railroad in 1849. All of these projects used the limestone from Sing Sing's quarries, which was known locally as um, Sing Sing Marble. The biggest construction project was the prison itself. Uh, as I mentioned, the men quarried, uh, to, uh, added uh, 200 cells in uh, 1831 and 200 cells right before the Civil War, um, enlarging the total capacity of the original cell block to 1,200. Although, as I've mentioned, later records showed that the population often exceeded that, uh, that number. This uh, uh, illustration is from, this bird's eye view is from 1870. It's an excellent um, view, except for the fact that the railroad is missing, and we'll learn more about the railroad in a moment. But um, this shows how the cell block became the center of a, of a small industrial complex. They also built uh, the um, Mount Pleasant female prison completed in 1839. Maybe, uh, Nicole, you can show that uh, the female prison at the top, of this, the top of this image. A handsome Greek, Greek revival building uh, made of Sing Sing marble and located um, just southeast of the uh, cell block on a hill overlooking the Hudson River. Uh, it, could, it could accommodate 80 women, but it was often overcrowded. Uh, next slide. The female prison uh, was, was managed by women who were called matrons. And let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, Eliza Farnham uh, was one of the uh, matrons at the, at the women's prison at Sing Sing. 
Um, and this prison, uh, and she was responsible for uh, some major um, uh, uh, changes in prison, prison reform, major innovations. And you can learn more about her work and the female prison, um, which was called the Mount Pleasant uh, Female Prison, uh, on one of our webinars, which is on our website, uh, featuring pr Professor Jennifer Graber of uh, University of Texas at Austin. Um, the female prison closed in 1877. So after 1877, uh, Sing Sing became an all-male facility. Now I'm going to uh, turn the program back to Nicole, who will talk about railroads. So Brent just mentioned the Hudson River Railroad, and we're going to elaborate a little bit on that since it's played an important role in the history of the prison. So the Hudson River Railroad reached Ossining on September 29th, 1849, opening the village up to industrial development along the waterfront. Among the riverside industrial uh, concerns benefiting from the railroad were the limestone quarries at Sing Sing Prison. These businesses gradually replaced the boat builders and docks that had occupied the riverfront in the early 19th century. Cornelius Vanderbilt gained control of the Hudson River, Hudson River Railroad, bit of a tongue twister for me, in 1864, soon after he bought the parallel New York and Harlem Railroad. And a few years later, Vanderbilt consolidated this line with the New York Central Railroad, and he was the dominant force in America's transportation infrastructure. Uh, and before his death in 1877, he was one of the richest men in America. The railroad brought not only freight in and out of Sing Sing, but also opened passenger service and spurred the growth of New York's northern suburbs. Passengers arriving at Austining Station included men sentenced to serve time in Sing Sing Prison. And today the train is one of the main sources of transportation for visitors to the men incarcerated at Sing Sing. Sing Sing is also America's only prison with passenger traffic running through the facility. So every day, uh, Amtrak's Empire Line and Metro North commuter trains actually pass through Sing Sing. So you can see it just goes straight through the prison itself. Uh, on February 19th, 1861, Abraham Lincoln traveled through Sing Sing by train en route to his inauguration in Washington, D.C. The prison's population saluted the train as they did on April 27th, 1865, when the train bearing the assassinated president passed through the prison on its way to Springfield, Illinois, where he was buried. So I'm going to hand it back to Brent to talk about ruin. So the, the railroad enabled Sing Sing Prison to grow in the 19th century into a small industrial complex where the incarcerated population manufactured a variety of products, including hats, shoes, buckles, cast iron stoves, and of course, Sing Sing Marble. And you can see in this illustration, uh, this complex of buildings, this is from uh, 1884. Uh, you see the quarries in the um, uh, upper portion of this, of this slide and also the buildings surrounding the cell block. The cell block is, is the anchor to all of, these, uh, all of these other buildings. And this is where the incarcerated population was housed and where they worked. And um, this, uh, the conditions uh, in the prison um, unfortunately deteriorated uh, during this period of time. And media coverage of escapes and strikes and protests and riots uh, contributed to the pr prison's infamous reputation. In the 1890s, the introduction of capital punishment by, through the electric chair also created a negative image. So the village of Sing Sing in 1901 grew tired of the association with the prison and actually petitioned the state legislature to change its name from Sing Sing to Ossining. Uh, and they also didn't want to have their uh, the products produced in their village uh, um, associated with products produced at the prison. There were uh, efforts in the early 20th century for reform and re improvement. The state abolished the lockstep that I talked about earlier and the striped uniforms. They installed large windows and lights in the, in the cell block. They introduced the nation's first parole system, also an education department, and the first prison newspaper called the Star of Hope. The overall conditions, however, remained appalling and unhealthful. In 1914, Arthur Conan Doyle, 
the author of the Sherlock Holmes detective story, spent one night in the cell block and said, uh, these buildings, uh, th this place ought to be burned down. The buildings are absolutely antiquated and there's nothing less than a disgrace for a state as great and wealthy as New York to have a prison which is 100 years behind the times. Next slide. Um, the slide on, on the right is from 1897, and it shows, this is from a Sanborn map company uh, 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 products that the Sanborn map company produced uh, insurance maps, but they're wonderful resources for historians of, of, of places throughout uh, the country. And Sing Sing was very well documented by the uh, Sanborn map company. The slide on the, uh, the image on the right is from 1897 and shows the complex of buildings around the cell block. The cell block is the long blue uh, building um, that uh, is where the uh, incarcerated population live. Um, and anything in blue is, is uh, made of stone. Anything in red is made of brick and anything in yellow is made of wood. Uh, many of the buildings surrounding the cell block in 1897 were already considered obsolete and were, were, were being torn down. The building on the, the image on the left is from uh, 1924. And by that time, um, the, uh, a new prison was being built on the east side of the tracks. And all that was left were a handful of buildings along the river. And you can see the <clears throat> image of the, um, the cell block. Uh, uh, part of it is already vacant. They've already started tearing uh, the cell block down. In, in November 1917, uh, Governor uh, Charles Whitman uh, presided over an elaborate uh, ceremony marking the end of the old cell block, but it took many years before the cell block was abandoned. In fact, the last prisoner did not leave the old cell block until 1943, a full 26 years after uh, Governor Whitman, uh, Whitman declared that the old old cell block was going to be demolished. Uh, you also see in this image from 1924 at the very bottom of the of the uh, slide a building that's named the death house and this is where the um, uh, executions by, elect uh, by electric chair were carried out. There were 614 executions at Sing Sing from 1891 to 1963. Um, and it's another one of the stories that we will be telling um, at the uh, Sing Sing Prison Museum. Next slide. Between uh, 1943 and 1984, the old cell block was um, used for light manufacturing and record storage. There was even a boxing ring uh, built in the north end of the, of the structure. You see the, uh, the um, foundation of the boxing ring at the, at the bottom of this, of this slide. Uh, there was a fire in 1984 that destroyed uh, everything in the building and the roof of the building. So the surviving ruin, and we'll go to the next slide, <clears throat> the surviving ruin is all that remains of the 19th century cell block and the surrounding complex of buildings. This is the only evidence of the 19th century that we can find, uh, above ground at least, at Sing Sing Prison. Now back to you, Nicole. So while we generally know Sing Sing as a site of great brutality, it's also been a site of reform beginning over 100 years ago. Thomas Mott Osborne was appointed as warden in December 1914. He was a wealthy industrialist from Auburn whose family had a long association with social justice and progressive reform and he turned his attention to prison reform, first in Auburn and later at Sing Sing. And his philosophy reflected the prevailing beliefs of the progressive period, that government action should protect citizens and promote democracy. And the emerging acceptance of social science gave rise to what was called the new penology. And the basic assumption was to pay attention to the prisoner as an individual rather than as a subject to be changed through hard labor or religious salvation. And this was a clear break from previous ideas. By the time Osborne arrived in 1914, conditions had deteriorated at Sing Sing Prison. He explained his philosophy for reform in a New York Times editorial dated June 10th, 1916. 
I believe that every man has in him the possibilities of reform, and we have no right to say that any particular man is among the failures unless we've given him a fair chance to make good. And even when we have classified him as a failure, I would still hold the door open. In the same editorial, he also offered a pointed criticism that our stupidity in continuing for generations a prison system which was a disastrous failure, giving no man a chance, is only matched by our stupidity in continually letting out of prison men who are more dangerous to society than those going in. So to achieve his goals of reform, Osborne created the Mutual Welfare League, which promoted humane treatment and believed that allowing incarcerated people the freedom to govern themselves and accept personal responsibility would then allow them to build better lives in prison and a better society when they came home. With a motto of do good, make good, which you can see on the coin, and a board of elected delegates, the Mutual Welfare League allowed the incarcerated men to plan programs that met their needs. They had an internal currency and weekly wages, which gave them the ability to own possessions for the first time in the prison's history. They also had their own court system of punishment for minor offenses that encouraged accountability amongst the prison's population. Programs were run by committees made up of the incarcerated that included athletics, education, legal, and entertainment. Osborne attracted private support from foundations and corporations to establish a psychiatric clinic led by Dr. Bernard Gleck. While Osborne faced resistance from Albany and from within the prison itself, his influence was profound and is still considered a model for reformers today. He asked the question, are prisons meant to be scrap heaps or human repair shops? Osborne left Sing Sing in 1916, and in 1920, Louis E. Laws became warden. Laws retained some of Osborne's initiatives, especially the Mutual Welfare League and opportunities for recreation. He recognized that improved morale and individual rehabilitation were only possible in an environment that provided recreation, entertainment, healthy living conditions, and rewards for good behavior. Laws encouraged the prison population to engage in sports, creating baseball and football teams within the Mutual Welfare League, and even invited New York professional sports teams to play against the Mutual Welfare League teams before an audience who would pay 50 cents for admission. He also allowed the men to attend concerts and exhibition games and to partake in the emerging popular culture of the 1920s offered by radio and movies. He cultivated relationships with the media and with movie moguls such as Harry Warner, one of the founders of Warner Brothers, who paid for the construction of a gymnasium in 1934. Charlie Chaplin and Houdini were regular visitors, and laws also ensured that each incarcerated man had at least a sixth grade education, and con he also constructed a new library at Sing Sing. His detractors accused him of coddling the men, but despite this, Sing Sing maintained many of his reforms over the years. And I would be remiss not to mention later reformers, including one of our board members, Brian Fisher, who became superintendent in 2000. He developed and expanded the existing rehabilitation through the arts program and implemented a variety of new programs. All incarcerated individuals are required to receive their GED and have the option to earn either an associate's or bachelor's degree through Hudson Link for higher education. There's also a family reunion plan or program, aggression replacement therapy, an incarcerated veterans program, and many others. So while each of these reform movements faced criticism, they had lasting effects on Sing Sing and the men and women incarcerated there. And they also shaped a wider discussion of prison reform in which Sing Sing is often regarded as a leader. So now that we've given you a crash course in Sing Sing history, I'll turn it back to our director, Brent Glass. Thank you, Nicole. And we're gonna spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, the museum that's uh, under development uh, in Ossiming. Uh, we have a board of directors, a, a wonderful group of uh, volunteers who have um, organized uh, this, this effort, raising money, uh, bringing in different resources, forming partnerships uh, in the, in the Ossiming area, but really throughout the New York region and, and even nationally and internationally, we've now become accepted 
as a member of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience uh, just very recently. So we're delighted with that development. Uh, the board has adopted the mission statement that you see on this, on this uh, slide. Sing Sing Prison Museum is the extraordinary location where the complex and compelling stories of incarceration are shared on the grounds of one of America's most historic active prisons. It's a site of self-reflection and learning. The museum challenges all of us to imagine a more equitable criminal justice system and to take action toward building a more just society. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, the plan for the museum may sound simple, but it's very, very complex. We're going to rehabilitate uh, the building you see on the far right, the 1936 powerhouse. This was the building that provided electricity to the prison. It was built in 1936. It was decommissioned in the 1960s and has largely been vacant, although there's still a, um, an auto repair shop that's uh, in use uh, in the building and some record storage. We're planning to rehabilitate that building as, a, as our museum with exhibition galleries, a theater, classrooms, uh, a, a space for conferences, um, an office space, some, uh, possibly a, a counseling center for re-entry uh, programs. And we're going to then connect this powerhouse through a secure corridor, corridor that you see there that's labeled proposed walkway to the 1825 cell block. And we will connect to the historic cell block, the stone building that you saw earlier in this uh, program, and allow visitors to go into the building, probably about a, a hundred feet into the building. Remember, this is a building that is 476 feet long, and it is within an active um, maximum security facility. So we, we are going to be very sensitive to keep the museum function and the uh, function of, of um, uh, conducting and managing the correctional facility to keep them very distinct and separate. Uh, the Warner Brothers Gymnasium that Nicole mentioned earlier is right next to the 1825 cell block, but that is not included in our initial program. Uh, another point worth mentioning looking at this uh, slide is uh, on the right you see the uh, note that the Ossining train station and Havistraw Ferry are located just about a 10 minute walk from the train station to the powerhouse. So that's another advantage of, of this plan. Next slide. So the plan, uh, this is the, an image of the powerhouse in, in 1936. Uh, on the right, on the left is the, um, is the uh, current uh, powerhouse uh, and the condi conditions in the powerhouse actually are quite uh, stable, although this slide looks like it uh, needs some, some stabilization. Uh, the building is in excellent condition and we have a plan to uh, renovate it, stabilize it and begin to renovate and reuse and transform the powerhouse from a powerhouse that generated electricity to a powerhouse that will generate uh, education, ideas, and creativity. And in the next slide uh, is a rendering of what we intend to um, create in the, what is now being used as an auto repair shop uh, within the powerhouse. We just received a uh, wonderful uh, challenge grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, that will enable us to make this transformation. Next slide. Turn it to you, Nicole. So as the collections manager, this is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, it's our collection. And as a new institution, we're still in the early stages of collecting. Uh, we've conducted a collection survey and found there's an amazing variety of objects connected to Sing Sing's history. And we've been fortunate enough to acquire some of them, including this baseball from one of the exhibition games against the Yankees that I mentioned earlier, as well as an intricately carved wooden cane that belonged to Cornelius B. Collins, the superintendent of New York State Prisons uh, from 1898 to 1911. And our collection survey uncovered some other objects as well, everything from art, such as Andy Warhol's Prince of the Electric Chair, to a collection of daily menus, which helps set, shed light on the day-to-day -day life of someone incarcerated there. And there's, of course, more sensational things such as the electric chair known as old sparky 
or records from the Rosenbergs, one of the most famous executions to happen at Sing Sing. And we cannot deny that these macabre objects are also important to telling the prison story. But our approach to collecting is one that centers on the individual. Uh, we aim to follow ethical collecting policies that go above and beyond just what our field requires, that really put people first and respect the fact that we're curating trauma, both past and present. Um, so along with our collection, we also have extensive programming. In September 2019, we brought a dance performance to the riverfront called The Weight Room. It brought attention to the life of families impacted by the prison and some of the arbitrary things that they have to go through when they visit their loved ones. Um, as we've mentioned a few times, we produce a monthly webinar series, Justice Talks. These webinars bring in experts on current issues in criminal justice, as well as scholars who help share the history of Sing Sing Prison. Recent topics have included solitary confinement, Black history, and the female prison. And we're also very proud to say that we've produced an app uh, just search for Sing Sing Prison on the Apple App Store or Google Play Store, and you can access a number of curated galleries of photos, video, and audio recordings that tell the incredible history of the 200-year-old prison. It also includes a 3D scale model of the cell block and an individual cell to explore. And in case all of that wasn't enough, we're also beginning to offer tours again. Uh, and it really just shows the power of place. I've been working on this project for over a year before I was able to take a tour and it gives you an entirely new perspective of what you're looking at. So we hope you enjoyed our virtual visit to the Sing Sing Prison Museum. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sing Sing Museum. And I think now we're ready for some questions. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Nicole, and I, I do want to mention and make sure I uh, promote our next webinar, which will be July 21st, and it's a very special uh, presentation um, concerning the uh, Attica Prison Uprising, which occurred in September 1971, so we'll be um, observing the 50th anniversary of that uprising, and Heather Ann Thompson, who wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, history of the Attica prison uprising will be our featured speaker, also David Rothenberg, the founder of the Fortune Society, which is a, an organization devoted to working with people who are coming home uh, from uh, in being incarcerated, returning citizens. Uh, that, um, and David Rothenberg was a observer uh, in 1971 at the uh, Attica uh, uprising. So now we're taking our, any questions people have, Katie? Yes, we've got a bunch of questions, so we'll see how much we can get through in the time frame. Um, let's see, starting off, uh, of all the reforms made in the prison over the years, which one do you think has had the most significant impact? And I'll leave these open to either of you. Well, I, I, we've, we've talked about this a lot, and I think education, the uh, opportunities for education are very significant. A um, member of our board is Sean Pika, who's the executive director of Hudson Link for Higher Education in Prison. And it's very clear that making these, those educational opportunities available to the men there has had a, a very positive impact. We had a question in the Facebook chat. Are there any stories of the prison being haunted? Um, so we know that some other prison museums uh, do sort of haunted house tours. And we're trying to really step away from that and from any sort of sensationalism. Uh, one of my coworkers likes to say that it's not haunted uh, only by the ghosts of prison reform efforts past. <laughs> I think that's a great, a great, I'm glad the question was raised because we're, we're making a very uh, conscious effort to um, not talk about the paranormal or um, ghost stories because I, I think that the, the true stories of Sing Sing are compelling enough. This history is just so robust and, and complex and that's where we're uh, paying attention. I should also mention in terms of major reforms, uh, the Rehabilitation Through the Arts program is very significant and one of our partnerships that we're envisioning in the future is working with that program. Do you have any books you'd recommend to those interested in learning more about the site? 
Wow, there's a lot of, um, this book I, that was recently republished called Life at Sing Sing, which was written by a uh, man who was incarcerated at Sing Sing. It was one of the, he was one of the first editors of the Star of Hope newspaper. Maybe he was the first editor. And it's an excellent uh, memoir of Life at Sing Sing around 1900. I think uh, Michelle Alexander's book, the, uh, the New Jim Crow, about the current um, uh, mass incarceration issue is something for contemporary readers. But um, some of, um, some of um, uh, Thomas Mott Osborne's writings, that if you can find them, or articles that he wrote, I think are really interesting. Uh, there's, there are a number of great, uh, great books, uh, both fiction and some nonfiction, some poetry. Walt Whitman visited Sing Sing in 1869 and, and wrote a poem called The, uh, the Singer in the, in the Prison, which um, uh, we, uh, in our poetry uh, uh, webinar in April, um, uh, Victoria Gonzalez did a wonderful reading of that poem. So there's, there's quite a bit of, of literature um, uh, about the prison that, uh, that we, can, we could recommend. And that question was not planned, so I'm impressed you had that book handy. <laughs> one, of, one of the slides referred to Mount Pleasant Prison. Did the name of Sing Sing change? So it, it changed a lot over time. Um, so the village's name, I think, changed from Mount Pleasant to Sing Sing to Ossining and uh, the village didn't want to be associated with the prison. Um, so there was lots of name changes going back and forth. Um, Brent is probably going to know the exact timeline of when it changed to what, but it was, I think, Mount Pleasant. I think the prison was called Mount Pleasant, Ossining, and then finally Sing Sing. I think, well, we can, we can uh, actually, Dana White, who is, the, who is formerly the, uh, the village historian, now a member of the Board of Trustees of the Village of Austin, has the timeline memorized. In New York State, it's so complicated because jurisdictions overlap and you have, you have townships and villages and, and um, often sharing the same boundaries. So Mount Pleasant was a designation at the same time that Sing Sing Village was created. And so the, the Mount Pleasant uh, female prison was actually located uh, right next to the, the, the Mount Pleasant State Prison, which was later, later called Sing Sing. I don't want to confuse our audience too much, but um, it is interesting. And the most interesting fact to me is the, is the back and forth between Ossining and Sing Sing, because uh, in, in 1970, the prison decided to change its name from Sing Sing to the Ossining Correctional Facility, and that upset the town very much because they didn't want their their the prison to be have the same name as the town. So in the 1980s, the prison changed its name back from from Ossining back to Sing Sing, and that's what it's called today, Sing Sing Correctional Facility. How many people lived in each cell? I uh, so. It was originally designed for only one person per cell, right? We said it's about the size of a yoga mat. So Matt, like, you're not going to fit that many people on a yoga mat. But overcrowding was becoming an issue in our prison. So it went to two people and sometimes even three. Um, so I think it was in 1908 that we have a report of three people per cell in some cases. Yeah, overcrowding was, was a terrible problem. And that, of course, made the... the uh, uh, infectious disease circulation even even more of a problem the the drinking water was was um, was horrible the conditions were really brutal and uh, the overcrowding contributed to that um, so um, we do have evidence even in some of the maps that I showed you where they would uh, they the um, people who were creating those maps would document how many people were living uh, in the uh, in the prison at that time, and it was usually more than 1,200 people. Uh, 1,200 cells uh, were was was the limit until the 1920s when they began to expand. I think there are now um, less than 1,400 people, uh, men, incarcerated at Sing Sing, and I think they have the capacity of around 1,800 um, cells. 
Are any current or past incarcerated individuals of Sing Sing involved in the planning of the museum? Yes. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, Sean Pika, uh, who is the uh, <clears throat> secretary of the board, is formerly incarcerated. Uh, we have um, uh, the wife of um, one of our, uh, one of the members of our board is uh, married to a man who had recently been incarcerated and now works for the Marshall Project as a, as a journalist. Um, the former um, director of, of the superintendent at Sing Sing, Brian Fisher, is uh, on the board and he was also the commissioner of the New York uh, Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. And Art Wolpinski, a member of our board, is, uh, is currently a correctional officer at Sing Sing. And then we've also started working with a group of formerly, well, we've previously worked with groups of formerly incarcerated people. The museum has recently hired two returning citizens, one of whom was at Sing Sing, uh, to work on an oral history project. So we'll be interviewing people connected to the prison system in various ways, and also to uh, design some community outreach programs to really help the prison serve the population of returning citizens. So we try and stay very involved. Great. Do you work with any other prison museums while you plan the Sing Sing Museum? Nicole, you can. Yeah, uh, so we're part of the Prison Museum Consortium. It's an internal group of, I think, seven uh, prison museums around the country just to discuss different issues that we've encountered, sort of to brainstorm what our best practices should look like. Uh, so let's see, Newgate Copper Mine up in Connecticut, Eastern State Penitentiary, uh, Old Idaho Penitentiary, and a few others are also uh, Alcatraz. Alcatraz. Um, and then actually at the Mid Atlantic Association of Museums conference happening in October, uh, I'll be presenting alongside uh, someone from Eastern State and someone from Alcatraz about how our museums work with returning citizens. That's great. And we are almost out of time, so I'll just end up with one last question uh, for you both or whoever wants to answer it. When, once the museum is up and running, what do you hope people take away from a visit there? Well, we want to, uh, first of all, educate people about the, the history of Sing Sing and to see the connection and the relevance between this history and contemporary issues. And we also want to challenge the visitor to, um, to think differently about our, our uh, and, and think about a more equitable criminal justice system. We read so much about the, the inequities of the system and we hope that the museum causes people to think about the fact that there are, there are other options. What are the other ways of, um, of, um, of creating a safe society? Uh, and above all, we want them to think about why do we have prisons? What is the purpose of prisons? Is it to rehabilitate? Is it for retribution? Is it for punishment? Um, is it to um, uh, help somebody uh, change their lives? Um, what, what is the purpose of, of prison? And, we, and that's an open-ended question. We're not asking it, uh, assuming that we have the answer. I think it's that and that we can, you know, as a, as a museum, we can create change. Um, I think that's something that's very important to me when working on this project too, is just the idea that um, as an institution, we can do better and we can help the world be better. And um, also I just met with, with our two new employees and I wanna share what one of them said is that the, the people inside there are humans, they're not numbers. And that's really what our goal as a museum should be is, is to make sure people are always reminded that, you know, it, it's humans at Sing Sing and what they're going through is not always great and and we can do better. I think the the other takeaway that I have heard when I've talked to people who've been incarcerated and they say I want to be recognized as a human being and not by the worst day of my life or the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. So uh, I think that's a takeaway that we hope uh, the visitors uh, uh, um, can think about. Thank you. It's really wonderful. And Brent and Nicole, thank you again both so much for your time and being with us here today. Thank you for the opportunity.
And thank you to everyone for watching with us today. And be sure to join us back here next week, Wednesday at 4 p.m. for our next program in our virtual tour series. Uh, we'll be doing Civic Season, where we'll go on a virtual walking tour of Harper's Ferry National Historical Park and explore the actions of John Brown, civil disobedience, or civil war. And just again, a reminder for those high school and middle school students out there, if you're interested in more history and civics opportunities for this summer, be sure to check out our summer programs at our website, nationalhistoryacademy.org. And everyone, again, thank you for being with us, and I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day.